Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for the AFMS seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Miguel Posas de Pando, who is an Associate Professor in Fluid Mechanics at the University of Cadiz in Spain. Uh, he received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique in 2012, and his research interests are computational fluid dynamics, numerical optimization, and its applications in aeroacoustics and hydrodynamics hydrodynamics stability, and he's going to be talking about some of his research today. So please go ahead and take it away, Mika. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening, everyone. So today I would like to show some of the um, uh, problems that uh, we've been working on uh, recently. So um, I'm presenting some, uh, develop some tools and applications that have the common uh, uh, basically, the common theme that they, they share all together is that they use the agent uh, techniques, or the agent operator at some point. So what I'm showing here today is a collaboration with um, Anton Glaskov, uh, Peter Schmidt and Lee here at Oxford, Anthony Lahoc and Luis Lafuente at the University of Cardiff, and our collaborators, Alejandro Quiroz, Serena Constanzo, Janice Sayen, Pascal Frey at Sorbonne. So the motivation for this work is uh, I think probably uh, some of you might know is the, the flow instabilities that appear into the machinery. Here I'm showing the cross section of a jet engine. You see that for the different components, uh, we have different types of uh, flow instabilities that at some point uh, they compromise uh, the integrity, may compromise the integrity of the, these devices or degrade its performance. So we might have uh, thermoacoustic instabilities, uh, really hydrodynamic instabilities such as search and uh, rotating store, which are the ones that I'm, I, I'll talk, uh, I'll, focus, uh, I'll focus during this talk. So here, the, for, in this case, uh, for the rotor, what we usually have is uh, basically there's a rotating uh, uh, element, which is, is the rotor. And the flow that is coming in the horizontal direction because of the relative motion arrives at an angle of attack. And because of this, there is some uh, mechanical work that is exert onto the fluid. And then into the stator, through the stator, the second uh, row of plates that you see in the, in the movie, the kinetical energy is recovered into the built up into a total pressure. So the, the characteristics of these devices are usually presented in a compressor map, just such as the one shown here. In the horizontal axis, we have the flow rate. Vertical axis is the total pressure, uh, the ratio of total pressure. And then for each rotating speed, uh, we have one of these curves, the black line uh, here. And then for a given configuration, we basically, uh, given mass uh, flow rates, we have a total pressure ratio. So then uh, if we want to work, uh, have the machine working close to maximum efficiency, uh, we have to move next to the uh, blue line here. And then what we see is that if we go further beyond, uh, what we have basically is a number of instabilities that we want to avoid, such as search or rotating store. So typically what we have at this point, the red point here is something like this, where the uh, flow pattern that is initially, it's purely horizontal, um, it's, uh, as it has a thermodynamic symmetry. At some point, this uh, symmetry is broken. As you can see here, there is a number of blades where the flow pattern is distorted. And this, uh, basically these flow structures that are seen here, they rotate at a fraction of the rotor speed. So the classical description of this type of instability is shown here on the video on the bottom uh, right. Basically, because of the reduce, as we reduce the mass flow rate, we're basically increasing the angle of attack of the, the different blades until at some point uh, one of them might stall. And as it stalls, it basically reduces the mass flow uh, between two neighboring blades. And this produces a pattern that rotates at a fraction of the uh, rotor speed that is usually known as a, a rotating stall. So the main uh, a purpose of uh, the research that is shown here today is basically on developing uh, computational tools uh, to study uh, this type of instabilities, and then uh, be able to, once we understand how they work, uh, manipulate uh, manipulate them by using some flow control uh, of, uh, and optimization techniques. So here's the outline of my talk. So the main part of my talk is going to be on uh, stability and sensitivity in flows into the machinery. So I'm gonna show first I'm going to build up uh, tools uh, progressively, first from the linear regime and then onto the nonlinear regime. And then in the second part, if we have time, then we will use uh, basically the sensitivity information that we derived in the first part. So how can it, how, how can it combine into uh, algorithms that can be used to perform optimization? 
And uh, if there is a time at the end, I will mention some of the strategies uh, that one can use to accelerate the evaluation of this gradient because after all, everything is, they, they are still, um, from a computational point of view, quite demanding. So first on uh, stability and sensitivity of uh, intermachinery flows. So here I have a, a typical section of uh, the jet, jet engine. And in the following, we're gonna address uh, three different uh, issues in developing these tools. And so for the first one, we wanna look at the flow dynamics uh, within a single blade passage. So we see that these machines, they are uh, built by assembling, uh, by repeating uh, and periodic arrays of, uh, of different uh, units. For example, here we have for the rotor uh, blade passage, and we have an array of them for the for the rotor. Then uh, we have the coupling between different units. So of course we don't we don't only have the flow dynamics within a single unit, but also uh, between different blades. And then at the, uh, finally, what we have is the interaction between uh, elements that are at relative motion, such as uh, rotor and, and stator. So then we will develop tools that are gonna address these uh, three specific issues and then show them on, on simplified configuration. So we'll see that in this uh, talk, what I'm basically showing is a little bit of the development tools, uh, how are they designed and so on. And then we wanna present them on simplified uh, configurations that are complex enough to show main characteristics that you would find in realistic configurations, but still at a reasonable computational cost just to uh, show their the performance. So, um, so the, the starting point for the single blade passage is uh, here. So considering uh, 2D simulations, uh, it's a high order uh, compressible navier equations equation we are solving for the acoustics. And we have a typical um, a control diffusion airfoil at Reynolds uh, 100,000, map 0.3, with usual boundary conditions. And we compute the um, uh, nonlinear evolution of this flow. So what we observe is a laminar uh, separation bubble from approximately 30% to 50% of the code. And then there is a, a vortex shedding on both surface of the, of, the, of the blade. It's more noticeable on the, on the suction side, in the second, the second half. And there is a, a radiation of acoustic noise at, from the, the trailing edge that propagates uh, onto the, the upstream. So if we take a look at the pressure probe uh, to position like such as this one, this is a typical, uh, uh, pressure spectra where we see a different set of peaks um, where the most dominant ones are shown shown here. So we can gain a look, we can gain a little bit of uh, insight into uh, what these frequencies are related to by taking the, the Fourier transform of the entire flow field. But we observe that for the main uh, the main peaks, we observe some coupling between the higher dynamic features that are shown uh, here next to the, uh, in the boundary layers and the wake of the airfoils plus some acoustic radiation that is more noticeable uh, upstream within the blade passage and up in the, in the upstream uh, volume. There are some other uh, high, high frequency uh, peaks, such so as, just, just for example, this one, number seven here, where it is that we observe some acoustic resonances uh, within this uh, blade passages. So with this configuration in, in mind, we would like to see, we would like to, uh, see how much of uh, what we've seen before can be described from the from a linear point of view. So since this is going, to, um, I'm gonna uh, some of the most of the methods that I present here today uh, they share they based on the, the same equations. I'm gonna show them a little bit here. So the starting point is a linear flow solver that is represented schematically uh, here. So F is basically flow solver with uh, boundary conditions and the governing equations. G is a number of design variables. This could be, for example, uh, parameters that characterize the shape of the blades or uh, the, the, the amplitude of uh, suction and uh, blowing and suction at the, at, the, at, the bound, at the boundary of the walls, some volume forcing, et cetera. So with this, Q and Q naught are the flow field. And then here by capital J represent the initial conditions. Then in linear analysis, as it's usual, we decompose the flow field into a, into a base flow, capital Q plus a perturbation, and then uh, perform a, a Taylor expansion and retain only first order terms. In more compact form, uh, we arrive basically at a linear system that is subject to some initial conditions based on the initial, initial perturbation. So now if we take a look at the, um, the configuration that I showed before, uh, we linearize around the mean flow. 
and we observe in the mean flow, we have a, a separation bubble uh, showing uh, in the picture here at the uh, top, uh, at the bottom uh, left. And we consider initial perturbation that is basically an isentropic uh, vortex that is located uh, at the trailing edge, at the leading edge of the airfoil. So if we let this evolve, I'm gonna play this uh, once. We see the growth of instabilities, how they arrive at the trailing edge and uh, scatters uh, significant, uh, significant noise radiation um, from the trailing edge. And this uh, cycle is uh, repeated and it grows exponentially as it can be shown here by the uh, trace of uh, any um, flow uh, variable, sample the number of the pressure, et cetera. Et cetera. So, uh, what we see in the initial, in, from the initial, um, this impulse response is basically a wave packet that is uh, basically it's initial perturbation splits into wave packets that uh, propagate along the pressure surface and suction surface. As they grow, there is amplification on the suction surface uh, because of the uh, profiles of the separation bubble. And then there is a second wave packet that grows onto the, on the pressure, uh, pressure side. And then once it arrives, once this package arrives at the trailing edge, at the trailing edge is when there is some acoustic noise that it that, uh, generated, it propagates upstream, and then by uh, receptivity mechanisms at the leading edge, it propagates. Uh, this uh, process is repeated, uh, and it's uh, it's shown to be unstable. Here, is the, um, the evolution of um, the evolution of the pressure is shown once we factor the, the exponential growth. And we see there is a, there is a low uh, low frequency modulation at a delta omega approximately 4.56. <laughs> so some of the characteristics of uh, that are shown here in the input response can be uh, uh, analyzed uh, from the model point of view. So we're looking at the eigenvalues and eigenmodes of, uh, the, of the, uh, the operator, and then uh, here is the spectrum. And we see, we observe that there are some, there are two, uh, here there are two modes that are unstable. And we zoom in, we see also there are some other modes that are close to uh, neutrality. And these structures, they correspond uh, reasonably well with uh, some of the structures that have been shown before in the input response, but also in the um, uh, Fourier analysis in the, from the nonlinear flow field. And we observe also that the low, fre low frequency modulation is basically related to these two eigenmodes here that are uh, very close in relatively close in frequency and have a similar spatial uh, structure. Here on the uh, right column, we have the uh, uh, horizontal velocity uh, perturbation, uh, the velocity, and here on the left, uh, we have the pressure. So now, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of the design, it is interesting to know how these modes, how they change as we modify uh, the, 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 the mean flow. So here, changes in the mean flow are basically represented by changes in this operat operator A. So we want to know how this operator A changes the eigenvalues and eigenmodes, basically represented here by delta lambda and delta V. So basically by uh, sub uh, replacing in this equation above, and then by neglecting uh, high order terms, we had arrived at an equation such as this one. And here, what we see is that the variations in the, the changes in the eigenvalue are related to changes in the eigenvalue, eigenmode, but also to changes in the operator. So this is, uh, at this point, uh, we cannot compute delta V because we don't know what delta V, uh, delta, we cannot compute delta lambda because we don't know what delta V is. So what we do is basically use the adjunct, the, the adjunct eigenmode, uh, we trying to cancel this, uh, this term here. So basically, the adjoint modes, the adjoint modes, they satisfy this relation here, and because of this, we can project uh, the above equation onto the adjoint mode, and basically by doing so, we're canceling this term, and we arrive at a uh, at an expression that is much simpler to uh, to evaluate. So this expression is uh, it's interesting to look at uh, what it represents. So basically, this expression tells us that the changes. In the eigenvalue, because of uh, due to changes in the operator, this could be changes in the mean flow because of, uh, for example, due to a control cylinder or to a change in the boundary cohesion conditions and so on. So they basically uh, they are weighted by the spatial support of the direct mode and the adjoint mode. So that basically means that if we are uh, regions in the flow, basically components in delta A where V or V are uh, negligible, 
won't have much influence on uh, what the eigenvalue is. Whereas uh, on the contrary, if we have uh, special regions in, in, the, in, in space where V, there is a significant overlap between W, the agent mode and the direct mode, then the change uh, will be uh, significant. So it is very informative uh, to present uh, basically the spatial support, the basically the product between the eigen, the, the agent mode and direct mode. And we have uh, something just as here. Here is the Habermas product between W and V. And we see that there are reg the regions in the flow where we have large values, they correspond to regions in the flow where um, making changes in the mean flow will have a significant impact onto the, um, the eigenvalue. And this, and this, of course, the, I think what is important to see here is that because of the use of the agent mode, just from the, what we uh, basically from, we just computed, the eigen mode we computed anyways. And just from a single computation of the agent mode, we basically know what's the effect of perturbing, first of all, the effect of perturbing uh, anywhere in the flow uh, for the whole, uh, uh, in the whole spatial domain. So now, if uh, now we've looked at what happens uh, for a single passage, but then of course, uh, these devices, they are built by uh, arranging uh, a number of blades uh, uh, in the azimuthal direction. Uh, which is represented uh, here in the in on, on the slide. So here we have the passages that are number p uh, zero through nine. The example here and the portion of the state vector uh, shown also here. So if we consider, for example, uh, the initial perturbation uh, again, the same one, we see that the evolution is quite different uh, from what we had in the purely periodic uh, regime. We see that there is an acoustic uh, pulse that propagates upstream and also uh, excites uh, instability waves in the different, in all the passages, not just in, in the one where it was uh, located. And what we see is that there is uh, at some point, uh, there is a dominant structure and we see that the dominant structure is not uh, purely periodic. So we can see that there is a phase shift between uh, what happens in one blade and what, happen in, what happens in the next ones. So of course uh, we could tackle this problem with the tools that we uh, presented uh, before, but this is probably a bit more uh, informative uh, to consider what's the structure, consider the structure of uh, this stability or uh, linear operators. So if we arrange, <coughs> if we partition our state vector in terms of the passages, what we see is that um, the operator has a block circular structure. This is because the interaction, the dynamics of one passage uh, one the, with uh, another one, the one above, is basically the, is, uh, is the same one uh, for all the passages. And the interaction, for example, uh, with between one passage and one below is also the same for all the passages. So then the interesting, um, an interesting feature of these matrices is that since they are block circular, they can be easily yeah, diagonalized by uh, some uh, Fourier-like matrices. And because of this, uh, we can replace this uh, big eigenvalue problem that we have here by uh, a number of uh, smaller, uh, a number of eigenvalue problems that are smaller. And then the advantage of solving these systems instead is that we retain the structure uh, of the modes, the periodicity that they have across different blades, and also that they converge, uh, they converge faster than that when we. Uh, um, uh, faster than uh, what we would have we would have for the uh, original eigenvalue problem. So we solve these problems. What we see is that basically i equals uh, zero is basically the same is basically the same spectrum that we saw before. So nothing new. And then as we uh, compute the eigen the um, the eigenvalues uh, the the spectra for the different uh, for the different operators we see there is a richer dynamics one that we didn't see before in the purely periodic for the two periodic case uh, it's stable but the there's low frequency modes that become more unstable and then for five and ten we have some other modes that are more unstable than the, the ones that we saw for the purely periodic that at some point they will dominate um, the dynamics of the of flow field. Here, I'm showing here some of these modes. Uh, you see that the periodicity of the one blade is broken. And then uh, this is the dominant mode, which corresponds to uh, what we saw in the, um, in the linear response um, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the previous slide. So uh, just to uh, summarize what we've seen up until now, we've seen for the flow dynamics for a single passage, where there is a separation bubble where uh, instabilities grow. 
uh, it leads to a sort of vortices are compacted downstream. And then the growth of uh, also instabilities in, on the pressure or the pressure side, and then they lead to a trailing edge scattering, which is the, here in this configuration, the primary source of acoustic radiation. And in the case of a coupling between multiple passages, <coughs> uh, what we see is that there is uh, the, the, um, the trailing edge, the, the, the radiation at the trailing edge not only feeds back the um, instabilities for its, the, its own blade, but also uh, perturbs the flow in an other blades and it leads to a synchronization between uh, the different blades, the traditional dynamics that are not uh, taken into account if uh, we consider the flow periodic over um, over different uh, of one blade. So now this is for the linear regime. So uh, now uh, I'm going to show uh, for the third uh, problem, which is the coupling between um, between elements at a relative motion, we're going to move on to, on to the nonlinear regime. And here I'm going to show what's the advantage of using the action methods uh, uh, evaluating uh, gradients. So just a, a little bit of uh, background material. So again, we consider our nonlinear simulations here. Uh, we want to assess uh, how good a given design G is according to a performance metric or, or cost function capital J here, which depends on the flow field itself obtained from the nonlinear evolution of the, these equations. And also it depends on the uh, parameter choice that we, uh, uh, that we consider. So then this leads to an, um, an optimization problem where basically we're trying to minimize or maximize uh, the value of the cost function such that these constraints, the common equations are, uh, are fulfilled, which is basically shown, uh, shown here. Here I'm showing ESO contours of the objective function and then in the green line, it are the only uh, trajectories uh, where the state equation, the constraints are fulfilled. So the best design is basically the optimum shown here. And then um, usually in this uh, solving these type of problems, uh, knowing the value, uh, knowing the gradient is uh, very informative because it tells you it tells us about the local behavior of the cost function. So if we want to compute how changes in G affect. Change, uh, it leads to changes in the cost function. We just take the derivative uh, of this uh, problem here and, and use the chain rule. And what we see here is that when we take the derivative, there is this dqdg, which is basically how the entire flow field changes, how, how the whole simulation, uh, I have to recall that this is a nonlinear simulation, how this nonlinear simulation changes when we perturb every single parameter. And then this is obtained basically by just uh, taking the derivative of the constraints. And what we see is that this equation, it has to be solved once per uh, design parameter. And this is, of course, if uh, the cost of a simulation is, uh, um, is expensive, if we have 10 uh, or hundreds of design parameters, uh, solving for this equation hundreds of time, which is basically uh, solving uh, hundreds of simulations is not uh, feasible. So we would like to still uh, have the gradients, but we don't want to. Uh, we don't want to spend this uh, computational effort in solving this equation uh, many times. So to do so, uh, we're going to introduce the uh, Lagrangian. This Lagrangian here is basically J, the our original uh, cost function minus uh, uh, this uh, products where we have the constraints times this Lagrangian multipliers here. And you have to recall that since these two quantities here are zero. Uh, lambda and lambda naught, uh, we are free to choose them as, as we wish because this won't affect the change, uh, the value of the Lagrangian. And then we will want to consider is we're not going to consider the gradient of J, but the gradient of uh, the Lagrangian. So we go with the same procedure as it was outlined before. And what we see is that <laughs> as, as before, we have the sensitivities, this DQ, DG that we have here that we don't want to compute. But now we have a freedom. Uh, we can choose these lambdas as we want. So we're gonna choose them in a very particular way. We're gonna choose them in such a way that uh, these terms are zero. And then the advantage is that if these terms are zero, then the gradient does not depend on the sensitivity. And this is basically um, the advantage of, the, of, the, of this method is that now we can compute the derivative without having to compute how every single parameter affects the whole evolution of the, of the nonlinear flow field. So then in summary, 
uh, when we use the, uh, the, the this adjoint method, we want to compute dj uh, dg at, at some for some choice of design parameters. We first perform the nonlinear simulation. This is usually called the forward uh, the forward problem. We go from t equals zero to t equals capital T. This is usually iterated forward in time, and then uh, we have the, this adjoint equation, which is a is it is a linear equation, but that is where we have initial condition for the uh, for time uh, t equals capital T. Basically. Uh, we know how initial condition for the final time. So this equation is integrated uh, backwards in time. And this leads to what is usually known as the, as the backward problem. And then once uh, this, thanks to so, uh, the solution of this problem, we know lambda, uh, we know these lambdas here. And once they are known, we can compute the gradient. So the advantage of this, uh, this procedure is that this computationally very efficient because we have replaced uh, single evaluation of the, um, we have replaced uh, solving the sensitivities uh, many times. We've replaced that by a single evaluation, uh, single solution of the adjoint equation. Uh, this method, it has uh, some disadvantages, which is first that this equation, this the adjoint equation is usually not available in a, in a flow solver and it's require, it requires a significant development, development effort. It is also uh, memory intensive. Uh, because these uh, operators here, they depend on the forward, the forward trajectory. So basically, we have to store the whole, uh, the whole flow evolution. Um, so basically, we're, we're trading CPU time, uh, com uh, computational effort by uh, memory effort. But there are some techniques to alleviate this, uh, such as uh, checkpointing. And these techniques also, they have issues with cha chaotic systems. And there are some techniques to uh, alleviate uh, these problems, but this is an uh, area of uh, a significant uh, research effort. So now, once uh, we've presented this, so we, we now we, uh, in the context of uh, Turo machineries, we have a sliding interface. Basically, we have a roto is uh, a relative motion with respect to the stator, and we have we would like to be able to um, implement a gradients where we take into account this type of interaction. So in our in-house um, flow solver, we've considered we've implemented a sliding plane with a focus on. Uh, on their acoustics, so we want to solve acoustics propagating uh, from the state of to through the rotor and back uh, without distortion. And we've uh, implemented this using well compact schemes and then uh, interaction uh, exchange of information between the different uh, domains and interpolation between them with using uh, fourth order uh, Hermit polynomials. So this uh, sliding plane has not only been implemented, well, it is shown here. Okay, so we have a just as a, a simple uh, test case, we consider a flow that can be solved without the sliding plane, so we can make comparisons. And we see here uh, that these features, they propagate through the sliding plane without uh, distortion. And not only we have implemented the nonlinear um, uh, solver, but also it's adjoint. This adjoint uses, uh, is using uh, checkpointing, uses uh, um, petsing. And here, here is, for example, an, um, the evolution of uh, the adjoint field. So we're showing this uh, in reverse time. So now you saw that the, the second domain is moving upwards and now it's gonna move uh, downwards for the adjoint. And you will see that these sensitivities, they propagate through the sliding plane here uh, without introducing uh, acoustic features uh, and so on, which is important in this type of uh, uh, configurations. So in case uh, you wondered about the, um, what the control parameters are and the gradients, what gradients we're computing. We're basically introducing here into these jets, uh, we're introducing a number of vortices and the parameters are the, the, the location of the vortices. There are 40 vortices here. And we're computing how changes in the position of the vortices uh, leads to a growth of, uh, um, of small perturbations on top of the uh, baseline configuration. So here is uh, again, it's following the procedure we outlined at the beginning. We pick um, a flow uh, design parameters, such as, for example, here the position of these vortices. We iterate this forward in time. And once it's iterated in time for the nonlinear evolution, we iterate it backwards, such as to propagate uh, backwards in time the sensitivities. And once uh, we have the, adrian, uh, the evolution for the adrian field, and together with the, the remaining. Um, um, uh, flow variables, 
we basically compute gradients and identify in just one single uh, evaluation uh, the gradient of the this cost function with respect to changes of these uh, 40 vertices, basically 80 uh, control parameters. So now we, we've um, uh, tested this in a configuration where we have a, a stator and a rotor. And you will see on the left side of the screen, the evolution of the dilatation field, where we have uh, considered uh, nonlinear simulation and we have added some uh, perturbations shown here in the first half uh, of the um, of the break passages of the stator. Okay, so let me play this. You see on the right, the evolution of the eye trained field. Okay, so what we see, what we see here, I'll show this a little bit more in, in detail. So <coughs> we have two blades for the stator, three blades for the rotor. We introduce this perturbation in this region uh, here, and then iterate forward in time. So what you, what you saw uh, on, the, on the left, and then backwards in time on the right. And we see that there is, uh, first, there is interaction between the wake and the leading edge of the of the rotors that is then translated into acoustic uh, acoustic waves. These acoustic waves that you saw, they're also showing in reverse time in the art train because it's showing uh, where the acoustic waves, uh, with the sensitivity to acoustic waves that are gonna impinge on the leading edge at some point. There is also a uh, sensitivity to a convection uh, along the uh, course of the wake um, of the stator, but also along the um, stagnation line that it impinges on the rotor, acoustics that I mentioned uh, before. And then there are some other adjoint structures that are related to uh, how acoustic waves are distorted by the presence of the non-uniformities in the flow, such as the vortices here, or the uh, reflection of uh, these acoustic waves in the adjoint field uh, on, the, on the surface of the, of the rotor blades. So up until now, what we've shown is uh, basically uh, making an effort uh, to develop these tools uh, on a flow solver uh, that is, uh, co is compressible uh, to solve for this type of flows in, in turbo machinery. So now, once that we have the art joint, uh, we want to explore the kind of uh, optimization problems that we, we can solve. So with the, this, I'm going to show uh, some of uh, our work on uh, using the, doing some surrogate-based optimization, but uh, where we also use gradients to try to accelerate uh, the convergence. And I'm going to just present in an example here with a method named the die course. So with this optimization problem that we have uh, that, uh, presented before, for the simplest cases, we have uh, complex factor functions that are character characterized by a local minimum, which is, corresponds to the global one. But then for more complex flows, so what we usually have is non-convex functions where we have a, a local uh, large number of uh, local minima. This is characteristic of uh, these uh, complex, uh, complex flows such as uh, this one. So because of this reason, uh, we cannot use, uh, we, we need, there is a need for uh, algorithms that perform uh, global optimization that are able to convert not just to a local, uh, local minimum, but also uh, explore the, the landscape of the objective function and find uh, global, the global minimum. So optimization algorithms are uh, typically category, uh, we have a gradient based uh, to use the gradient that, such as for example, the one that I presented before, we follow in the direction of the gradient uh, just to get to the local minimum. And then we also have derivative free uh, procedures that are preferred uh, for a number of reasons that are basically a used, uh, that only use the value of J and for example, uh, different kinds. But uh, for example, here for the type of evolution algorithm, we have, a population uh, of uh, candidate points. And as this population evolves, it gets closer and closer and closer to a minimum that is around here. So the, the gradient base usually provides fast convergence to a local minimum. It is preferred when we have a large number of uh, parameters. And if we can evaluate the gradient efficiently, they are also efficient, which is uh, if we use the adjoint, they are. Uh, but they, they might have issues with uh, noisy functions. On the other hand, uh, the derivative free um, methods, they have a slow convergence to a uh, global optimum. They, they, they suffer from the course of dimensionality because we have to perform uh, increasingly number of evaluations as we increase the dimension of uh, our um, design space. 
And because of this, they have a high computational cost, but they, they have robustness uh, to a noisy function. So the idea is this, this is a way if we can combine both uh, to have the advantages, the best of uh, both worlds. So in the case of derivative-free techniques, uh, when we have in um, uh, expensive cost functions, is uh, it's quite common to use surrogate models. A surrogate model is basically a deciding is a model that is uh, of the cost function that is built on the points in the design space already evaluated. And that is uh, ideally, it's cheap to evaluate and also to build. And is it, it, is, it is used to avoid uh, performing evaluations at every single design point. Here is an example of uh, this type of uh, surrogate models. The blue line is the true, it's truth. It's basically the, 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 my underlying model. Then the black dots are the, the sample points that are known either because I, I evaluate them at the beginning of the optimization procedure or because I evaluate them as I uh, perform iterations. And then with these points, uh, we, can we can introduce an interpolant such as for example, the, the black line shown here. And then when I'm gonna decide where I'm gonna evaluate next, I'm gonna use basically this model here, which is uh, much cheaper than the uh, model in blue. So the idea is that uh, can we use, can we, can we accelerate uh, or improve the quality of these models by uh, including gradients? And if so, whether they are useful um, in this type of applications. So for example, here, uh, I consider also in the, the, the dashed uh, red line, it corresponds to an interpolant that is built not only using the value of the functions in the black dots, but also the slope, its gradient. You can see it, for example, in this case, uh, the, the, the red dash red line, it is a better uh, model for the true underlying cost function, which is so shown in blue, than the one in, in black. So uh, we're taking this uh, DICORS uh, algorithm that is, uh, was developed by Regis and Showmaker in 2013. And, and we've extended it by uh, adding uh, gradient information and I'm going to show uh, here very briefly some of the steps for uh, for this um, this technique. So the initial idea is the first uh, we consider uh, sampling points that can they can be obtained, for example, for Latin, Latin hypergroup sampling. Then we build a surrogate uh, surface, but now uh, using the gradients. So you see that the slopes are much at this uh, this point here. Then. Uh, we're going to generate a trial points uh, by basically uh, drafting them from a normal PDF center at the best point that we got so far. And then we're going to take a number of uh, trial points that are shown here in orange. And then see us, since uh, this model is cheap to evaluate, basically the cost, computational cost of evaluating this uh, orange interpolant is uh, negligible compared to the cost of evaluating the true uh, cost function in blue. And then once we get the best candidate, we perform uh, uh, we perform the actual simulation, just the expensive one, and then use the information that we acquired to, to improve this surrogate uh, surrogate surface. So what what we'd observe is that basically, well, of course, these surrogate models they have some uh, they have some. Uh, uh, free parameters and, and the quality of the model depends on how this, uh, these internal parameters of the kernels are chosen. And what we've observed is that uh, basically the criteria that is typically chosen uh, to select these uh, kernel parameters is not the same for derivative free. Um, it's not the same as the ones that we would like to have for uh, when we're using the gradient. Okay, so then these steps, they are repeated until the convergence is achieved. And then just as an example of uh, application of this algorithm, uh, for example, it's, uh, it's shown to uh, have the free implementation of the, this algorithm is available here using a flow solver that is, uh, so before we show applications on the compressible case. Now, uh, since we want to have, a, um, uh, we would like to perform uh, tests uh, with a smaller uh, turn time, uh, turnaround time, we're using a uh, uh, flow solver that's in compressible case and that tries to mimic some of the features that we observed before. So we consider here a cascade consisting of flat blades plus actuators on the surface. It's in compressible flow, I think it's 4,000. So it's uh, far from what you would like to have in applications, but still there is some um, 
uh, the flow is uh, far from being periodic. So, so sorry. So you see that this photo is here, and we're introducing this uh, tangential actuation here on the on the blades. So here, this is the basically this uh, these profiles. They basically consist of a tangential velocity on the uh, on the surface that is pulsated at a frequency, and we allow a phase shift uh, between them so that we can, we can allow uh, different blades to do uh, different things. We try to uh, reduce the pressure, the, the pressure loss. Uh, here, this is a state. This is basically stator, so basically there is no work accepted on the on the fluid. So we're trying to reduce the losses, also by also penalizing the the cost of the actuation. So we end up with uh, twenty. Uh, five, there are uh, basically four actuators per blade. There are uh, there are five blades, and in total we have twenty four control parameters. So what is shown here, here there is, a, there is a comparison in terms of the number of iterations between LBHSB, which is a, a standard uh, gradient-based uh, optimization algorithm. It's compared against the DICOS, which is the purely derivative free, and also g -DICOS, which is basically the algorithm where we're using also um, this, uh, this gradients. What we see is that in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the number of iterations, the value of the uh, cost function uh, represents how, how close uh, we are to the to the minimum, and then here we see that for the purely derivative free, it gets stuck into a local minima, and then the, these two uh, the other two alternatives they keep reducing uh, um, the cost function for the down. And we see that for the di -core, the G di cores, it gets uh, in fewer iterations a better uh, a better minimum. Of course, uh, the computational cost between these two is not equivalent uh, because uh, evaluating the gradients. Uh, in, for this flow solver, it translates into uh, performing an additional uh, evaluation. So basically, every iteration with GDI cores is, for this case, is uh, twice as expensive as performing this one. And but then when we uh, represent this in terms of potential cost, which is a fair comparison, we see that the GDI cores is still uh, performs better and it arrives at a better minimum in fewer uh, with the reduced uh, computational cost. Here's basically pretty much what it, 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 it the actuation looks like. And we see that uh, these vortices are observed in the, in the downstream. They are, for this minimum, they are reduced. And this, this separation bubbles, they're slightly, uh, they're slightly smaller. So then, but still, the, the issue with these methods is that still we need to perform many uh, iterations. So if we want to scale these uh, to cases such as the one they presented in the, at the beginning of the, of the presentation, there is still need for uh, accelerating uh, the compute, reducing the computational cost of evaluating the, the gradient. And this is basically what motivates uh, the use of uh, parallel in time methods. I will just briefly mention uh, what, what we can get from, from this. So basically, the idea is uh, to accelerate. It's basically trying to accelerate the, the forward and backward uh, solving the forward and backward problem by using parallel time techniques. Uh, the use of parallel, of parallel time techniques is motivated by the fact that we were already parallelized in space and this was uh, this at some point it saturates. And we want to explore uh, whether this can, uh, where we can gain a little bit of uh, time by also parallelizing in time. So I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm not gonna go through the details, but basically the idea is that uh, we can partition the time domain from zero to T for a linear system. <laughs> and we can decompose it into a, a inhomogeneous problem where we only take here the, this force in here, plus a homogeneous problem that is basically the one that gets the, 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 initial, the initial condition. Basically, the, there are many algorithms we're considering here, the, the, para, the linear para X one from Gander Util in 2013. And basically, every every thread, uh, every time partition needs to solve a number of times uh, once the inhomogeneous problem, uh, and then a few a number of times the homogeneous one. So the key idea here is that um, we'll just uh, show a little bit the the, the, the result is that uh, solving solving the homogeneous problem is uh, typically much faster than solving for the homogeneous. So even if uh, the homogeneous problem needs to be solved a, a number of times. Uh, it can be done much, 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 much faster uh, using uh, 
try law for exponential time integrators. And then uh, here is uh, the, there is um, here is an application where we're considering a cylinder here. We have actuations on uh, on the on the on the surface again. Uh, we consider we're considering the value of the tangential velocity at every single point as a design parameter. And then uh, we're comparing what we get uh, with uh, the original algorithm without uh, parallelization in time. Uh, we're comparing this when we're using four threads uh, to inter to basically to integrate the adjoint. So by doing so, basically reduce the the computational cost uh, by a factor of two, which is still it's a, it's, a, it's it's moderate. Um, but still uh, can accelerate uh, the, the optimization procedure. So just uh, to summarize, uh, with, with this, I, yeah. perfect. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So then I, I go to this uh, summary. So, um, so I will present it. Uh, so we presented the development of adjoint techniques uh, in, for stability analysis, but also for optimization. Uh, it's, they've been applied on a computational uh, acoustics uh, code, and they have then been demonstrated on uh, simplified configurations. They are still they are still 2D, but there is some still some compli uh, complex dynamics that are, can be representative of the type of uh, um, large scale features that we might observe in more complicated cases. And then for the stochastic optimization, uh, the uses uh, gradient uh, gradient information. In in these cases, they've been shown an improvement. And for the parallel time, they also we also see there is this a moderate a modest uh, speed up, and of course the obvious extension of this work would be to uh, take a look into uh, 3D configurations, but uh, explore different ways of combining uh, grading info grading information. So, for example, we could have uh, multi fidelity uh, information sources or multi objective, and of course uh, the application that these optimization algorithms that I show at the beginning uh, sh show in the second part of the talk. They have been applied on incompressible flow cases. There are more uh, canonical flows, so the the idea would be to extend this to the configurations that showed in the in the first part of the of the presentation. So, with this, I, I conclude. So, th thanks a lot for uh, attending to this talk, and I I'd be happy to take questions. Fantastic! Thank you so much for your talk. That covered so much yeah. information. That was fantastic. Oh. Explained it really well too. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a little bit of time for questions. So if you're sitting in the audience and you want to ask a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask away, uh, or you can put your hand up and I can call on you in the in the participants list, or you're welcome to just also type your question in the chat and I could read that out. Um, while people are, are just gathering their thoughts. Um, so I had just, it was kind of a, just a quick question about uh, I think it was your part on the nonlinear optimization in unsteady flows. That's kind of where it came up. Where I was thinking about like, how on earth do you pick a time step for these? Because you mentioned you have like checkpoints. Um, is it kind of just trial and error picking like when those checkpoints occur to make sure everything, okay. is it very sensitive to, to how often you output those checkpoints? So this is, uh, I, I assume that this is, um, is, is it on, uh, here? Uh, yes, yeah, this was kind of where it came up. Yes, yeah, so, so, so I, ideally one would need to store the whole trajectory. So that basically mm -hmm. would mean storing every few time steps, which is of course, this is, uh, this is unfeasible if, uh, except for the simplest uh, flow, uh, Simplest configuration. So what is typically done is uh, basically store every uh, every few uh, every few uh, points, and then uh, on the, the these points they are chosen optimally. So there is some derivations that one can do and, and decide uh, where these points are located. And then when we solving for the adjoint, we basically go into the checkpoint interval, and then we have to perform the nonlinear simulation not from the beginning but from the closest checkpoint. Forwards in, forwards in time and then backwards. Mm. So then, then the thing is that by by taking fewer uh, checkpoints, we're saving more memory. But then, of course, we uh, we have the computational cost that is that is associated with the forward uh, with the forward integration. Yes. So yes, it's a matter of, uh, <laughs> of of the trade off between uh, whether you want to spend uh, whether you want to allocate some memory or whether you want to. Uh, Pre-compute things that you computed that you computed already. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. It's always this balance, isn't there? 
um, all right. Uh, if you're in so the this is this is handled this is handled by the so this is uh, I don't, I'm not sure I mentioned this, but this is coupled with a TSI joint a library in Betsy, and it's coupled with a library that is uh, called Revolt that does all the check takes care of the checkpointing. It is quite popular uh, for this application. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions coming from the audience? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question. So I'm, I'm Lucas from uh, University of Queensland, and um, I wanted to ask about also about this this part of the talk, um, because uh, my experience with with such uh, chaotic flows uh, and not joint, um, in in most cases the the, the result of the adjoints are exponentially um, diverging and don't provide uh, a good gradient. So. Um, in the case where you where, where the parameters were with the disturbance in the in the vertices, uh, did you get a good comparison of that with uh, gradient obtained by finite differences? Yes, in the case in the case, uh, so it's, well, we have this performing the in a paper that is currently preparing, but there is a, there is a good match between the. The gradient obtained, uh, the gradient obtained from the adjoint, but also the gradient obtained by just find a difference of the forward trajectory. I mean, this is something we're going to run. Uh, of course, we're going to run at at, at some point. Uh, so here we're considering, but then the idea is that uh, there are among all the techniques that are so that being suggested in, in the literature to overcome these issues, some of them they they require a working implementation of the adjoint. So even if it's not exactly as, as as implemented here, but this is a building block that we can then combine with other tools uh, to attempt to avoid this, uh, overcome these difficulties with uh, this sensitivity with uh, exponentially diverging trajectories that is typically observed in chaotic systems. Okay, and could you comment maybe on uh, why do you think in your case uh, it's it's not a problem yet? Well, the, the flow here, here the flow is 2D. <coughs> so even, even though we have all these uh, small uh, vortices, structures and so on, but the, the flow is, uh, is 2D so that basically uh, mm, might reduce uh, a little bit the, the complexity of the flow case. And also, I think also one uh, another thing is that uh, the implementation of the adjoint that we are attempted here is uh, is for the uh, is the discrete adjoint. So it's uh, the adjoint is accurate up to machine precision in terms of uh, giving the gradient. So it's the, it's the it's the exact adjoint of the equations. Yeah, as but they are like implemented. The, the, so not the, the problem with chaotic uh, system it, it occurs in both discrete and, and, and continuous adjoint. It's it's not mm. uh, the issue of no, um, I, 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 yeah. yeah no no exactly. So I, I think I think it's probably because it's uh, it's two D and Really, there is uh, so, maybe it can be related to. Yeah. So, so yeah. another question here would be: um, so, did you like, uh, let's say, the design point in which you calculate the uh, these derivatives is is non-zero? So, like the the disturbance that you add to the to the flow is 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 non-zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or or not? Yes. Yes. It oh, is. the disturbance yeah. that is added to the flow is is, is non-zero. So basically, it's uh, it's basically uh, the, the the value of uh, the perturbation in all these regions here. So for every single grid point, there is a perturbation mm -hmm. that okay. is added on top on on top of the baseline uh, simulation. Yeah. Yes. I was I was interested if you tested stuff with uh, at at point zero because uh th th there are some let's say uh things that would point that uh that the, the, the problem with the um, chaotic response uh is, is related okay. to um starting from points that uh don't have a you know let's say if if your if your control or your your design mm -hmm. enforces the, the the moment of transition um then it lessens the problem of of chaotic Mm -hmm. um okay. uh, behavior i was interested in if you if you uh, cast it at all but, um yeah like no no we have not well, in this case still we don't have a we don't have a, a transition mechanism because the purely 2d simulation this is something we would encounter uh once uh, uh once we try this with a three-dimensional flow case 
Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, just a small understanding uh, to the first part. Uh, could you just comment because I, I think I missed it. Um, what do you consider the the um, the base flow uh, in in all these uh, eigenvalue com computation in the first part? Here? Yes. So the in, in the in, for the first part, uh, the, the the linearization point is uh, the mean flow. So, so you take a a window of time and you average the exactly. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, exactly. I, I, so, I window of time is average. Yeah. Make sure that the mean flow, the characteristics of the mean flow, they are well resolved, and then that's that is the linearization point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Uh, thank you for the, for the questions. Um, does anyone else in the audience uh, have a question they would like to ask? All right. Well, if if not, I think we'll we'll probably finish up. Oh, probably finish up. Sorry, I had a question. Oh, sorry. I don't know. Yeah, my, my camera's not working. Uh how Miguel is fully Can you just comment because oh, you said no. you 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 uh, you're planning to go to 3D. So from a point of view of the computational requirements, both memory and, and CPU wise, how, how much more Will the entire process of you know the checkpointing going forwards in time, doing add join? How much? What's the, you know, the order of magnitude of additional computations and memory requirements that you will require for that? Can you comment on that? <laughs> yes. So in terms of, uh, um, it, it 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 becomes much more expensive, but. Uh, it scales, it scales, uh, the scaling is the same that you have when you go from a 2D simulation to a 3D simulation, because it's basically the, the scalings are the same for everything that we have in the, in the um, uh, for all the steps in the, in the algorithm. So because okay. the, the adjoint, uh, the adjoint that we have here, it costs about, I mean, the, the implementation, it's, uh, it's, it's not optimal, but it costs about uh, 10 times uh, what, uh, for what problem it costs. It, yes, I know it can be, uh, we, we think that this can be reduced almost to a one, one to 1.5, the cost of the direct simulation. So that, that, can be, uh, that can be done. But then the scaling is the same with uh, the cost of the, where you go from a 2D nonlinear simulation to a 3D nonlinear simulation. Okay. Uh, at, least the, uh, at least the complexity in the number of uh, uh, computational complexity. Yep. And and parallelization. I mean, uh, that, can you optimize with some parallelization in a normal way, or you have to come up with a completely yes. new algorithm to implement parallelization? No, I think I, th I, th I think it can be done uh, in the same way because uh, for three D, can benefit from a better scale, uh, better scaling because you have suddenly you have much, uh, many more uh, uh, flow variables. So I think with the scaling that is right now, uh, it, it actually will have a better scaling than what we have right now in the 2D. Okay. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Do we have, we have, thank you, thanks for the question, Julio. All right, um, any last questions from the audience? All right, otherwise I think we'll finish up there right on time. Um, so thank you again to our speaker. Uh, for today and uh, this is our last AFMS seminar for 2022 but we'll be returning in 2023 so hopefully see you there okay thanks thank you Miguel thank you Chris thank you bye-bye